My name is Brian McKinley Jones Brayboy, and I'm the son of Mary Elizabeth Jones Brayboy. She was the daughter of Eva Sampson uh, Jones and Rose Bell McMillan Jones. She was also the daughter of McKinley Jones Sr. I'm also the son of Bobby Dean Brayboy, and he's the son of Eva Harris Brayboy and Tecumseh Brian Brayboy the second. Um, some of you all have heard this, but my parents, when they got together, they decided that if they had boys, my father would name them. If they had girls, my mother would name them. And much to my mother's chagrin, they had three boys. <laughs> so my, <laughs> my father named me after my, my grandfathers, uh, McKinley Jones Sr. and Tecumseh Brian Brayboy the second, so I realize that it's a um, that it's a mouthful, but there's a story with it. I've introduced myself in terms of who I am, but I'm also um, <clears throat> a son, and that's my father in the middle um, picture with our two boys, Quana on the left and Eli on the right, and they've switched positions here on on the bottom, and it's the job of a parent that I take really, really seriously, and I'm going to try to make some connections um, to that as I, as I move along in this paper, because I think fundamentally this idea of nation building is about children, it's about grandchildren, it's about our future as, as Native peoples. Um, I should say, in fairness, that this paper is going to be uh, published next month in the American Journal of Education. I've taken 40 pages and tried to condense it into about 16 for this talk. So it's, um, if you want a much more detailed conversation of this, I want to sort of uh, um, shine some light on this issue. It's a special issue focused on democratic uh, merit, which I think is a really compelling topic, and I'll say more about that in, in just a moment. One of the things I've been doing for the last 15 years is building programs to prepare indigenous educators and leaders to work in their communities. And at the moment, there are about, we've got about 125 of those educators who are, who are out there doing this work. And I want to draw on some of these as examples to think about how we might rethink graduate education and the work that we're doing. But I'm going to do what I often do, which is start with a, with a story. Um, just to contextualize this, this happened at, a, at an institution in the Rocky Mountain West where I had been a faculty for a number of years. We had written um, grants to the federal government, unlike your progressive country where your institutions fund these programs. We have to go externally to find our, our monies for this. So we'd gotten some monies from the federal government to have these, these programs to prepare these indigenous teachers. And, and the backstory of this is that it was unbelievably challenging at this institution to try to get them to take money from the federal government. And we're talking about chunks and millions of dollars as they were coming in to prepare these teachers, in large part because we were having these conversations around whether or not these young people that we were bringing in were qualified to be students at the institution and whether or not they would bring harm to the institution and, in an interesting twist, they would argue, bring harm to themselves by not being able to, to keep up. So we had this composite index at the university. They looked at your GRE scores, graduate record exam, and your high school or undergraduate grade point average. They put those together in some formula, and it would come out somewhere zero to four, with the index being indicative of what your first year grade point average is. And these students' first year grade point average, the predictive indicator for it was 2.14. So we had to go to battle over this. And it was only because we said, here's a million dollars to pay tuition for these people and a great PR tool where we can have them do this work. So we worked through our first cohort, and we decided to have a public celebration and a dinner. And the students came to me and they said, we want to talk. We want to thank the institution, and we want to make some remarks for our family. So we had 12 students. They each brought their extended families down. We ended up with, you, you know how many of you all know how indigenous peoples are. Everyone came um, because there was free food, which is... Uh, um, and I have to say to you, I am fully aware of the fact that you all are here for the food and not for me. Um, so I'm not sort of taking this personally that there are so many of you all here, but I thank you nonetheless. So here's what this... Here's what this young man said, and this changed the nature of the conversation that evening 
and really for the foreseeable future because when he was done everyone was sort of weeping um, and I'm just going to give you a, a, uh, um, a brief snapshot of it <clears throat> so here's what he said and, and I'm going to I'm going to read this to you so you don't have to do it yourself. I'm grateful for this program. I came to this university after being reared in a small town in Wyoming on my reservation. English is my second language. I don't do well on tests and there are still some sounds in English that my tongue can't make. But this program, they knew that we needed teachers and that they knew I could do this work. But this university, they saw me as a number and a test. How could they look into my heart and know that I was more than a number and a test score? How could they see that my people need help and that I wanted to help them? I will help them because that's what we do. We help each other. They sent me here. They supported my efforts. They let me bring my children here. They knew I would come back. But this institution, they saw a number and a test score. They can't see into my heart. This program did that for us. They looked into our hearts. They heard us. They gave us an opportunity when the university only saw a number and a test score. How could the institution know that I would work as hard as anyone else and what I didn't know I could learn? How could this place, this university, know that I wanted to do things for my community that only people from there can do? Well, they couldn't until someone told them. And it took this grant to make this university take a chance on us. So I leave this year university knowing how to teach and how to make lesson plans. I leave here knowing how to pass a test. I already knew how to serve others and how to be a citizen. He's a, a northern Arapaho. <clears throat> how to be northern Arapaho. And I leave here with a number that the university can understand, a 3.85 GPA. Most importantly, I leave here for the same reason for coming, to serve my people. So Joseph... Um, which is the name that I've, I've given uh, this young man, I think articulates, from my perspective, one way for us to think about graduate education, teacher preparation, and rethinking admissions issues, at least on a smaller scale, um, which is part of what I want to I put forward in this comment, and really try to connect this notion of democratic merit, which I will introduce to you in just a moment, and um, this idea of, of nation building as well. So here's what I'm going to try to do is really argue that the work that we do in institutions of higher education should be driven at least in, um, in some regard with some intent of working with our neighbors, often working with the people on whose lands our institutions sit, helping those nations as they sort of drive forward with their, with their own initiatives and engage in this nation-building notion. I'm going to outline what I mean by democratic merit, which is an, an idea that we've taken from a uh, Harvard law professor named Lonnie Guineer. Um, use this example of this graduate teacher preparation program that, that we ran for seven years at this institution and have continued in Alaska and in Arizona, and then just try to unpack what this means from a nation-building perspective. This notion of democratic merit, as Lonnie Guineer conceives of it, is, is really reframing merit, that is, the idea that people get what they deserve and what they earn. The traditional forms of merit, as you all know, are often rooted in test scores, and grade point average about how we admit students. And her argument is, is that that form of merit really rewards past accomplishments. The idea of democratic merit begins to flip that on its ear by arguing that what institutions of higher education might think about doing and in fact should do is rethinking merit around possibility and capabilities. That is, what will individuals contribute to their communities, to their nations, to their society in the future? She actually argues it's a fair test of the ability of the institution to take people that they think won't succeed help them unlock the power that they already have, and to be successful um, in their world. And what we do know, and what she points out um, really cogently in, in her own work, but what others have also pointed to, is that these standard forms of merit, that is doing well on tests and doing well on test scores, is much more indicative of what individuals' um, economic background uh, 
is rather than what their abilities and capabilities are. So she's asking us to name that, set it aside, and begin to think differently. There's a particular focus here on selection effects, which is what most merit-based institutions do in a traditional sense. The, um, those selection effects are, we already know you do well in school. We already know that you come with particular kinds of tools to do well in a system that we've set up. And so we know that you'll do well, hence these predictive indicators. Right? So there are these selection effects. This is what we do in these institutions. She's arguing that we should move to think about treatment effects. That is, what can the institution provide to students to help them succeed? not only in the institution, but for the world in which they're going to move. And, and often what we see actually are treatment effects in what, the, what militaries do with young men and women, which is to take them in, help them sort of unlock whatever they've already got in terms of capabilities, and become leaders. So there's a fundamental shift here for us in rethinking what we mean by merit. We move away from a test score and a number, as Joseph articulates, to looking into one's heart, into a student's heart, and saying, what is it that this person can contribute? How do we begin to say, this student is going to be committed to his or her community in a way that they're going to stay committed to that community and begin to affect some change? So I want to argue that looking into a student's heart is, or at least it should be, one acceptable way for us to think about um, admissions processes. Now, I, uh, sorry, processes. I'm learning Canadian as while I'm here, <laughs> um, and um, I'm learning all kinds of interesting things about Cirque du Soleil and roots. And um, those laughing the loudest are the students in my course who are giving me a crash course on Canadian history and innovation. Um, but I think it's it's important to think about admissions processes in these ways, at least on a smaller scale. And I want to suggest that after having done this for 12 years, I can tell you that this idea that Joseph raises about looking into a student's heart and thinking about democratic merit, that is, what an individual can do, what his capabilities or her capabilities and capacities are, we have evidence for the last 10 years of this working with programs that I've been part of. I want to be really clear. I'm not taking credit for those successes. I'm suggesting to you that I've been a part of them. And we've watched these young people, and sometimes not young people, just rise to the occasion. Because what they're being driven by isn't some sense of their own individual needs, but about what they can contribute to a larger community. This is a community-oriented way of thinking about this, both democratic merit and nation-building, which I'll define and outline for you um, in just a moment, rather than individual-oriented. This is a fundamental shift in how we think about what this work we do in institutions of higher education is. Right? If, particularly if you think about millennials, the research with, with millennials, that is, those individuals born in 1990 um, and they're younger into the 2000s, is it's very much a me-focused society. And that's the brand that our institutions focus on. Be a better you. Right? Create a better future for yourself. Well, what we have is some evidence that suggests there are other ways to have success and that not everyone's thinking the way that this larger research on millennials suggests it is. There's also some sense that we don't separate out the individual from the community. And so while it's community driven, nation building is, and this notion of democratic merit, it doesn't remove the individual from the process. Instead what it does is it suggests that the individual fits within the larger community is an, is an important part of that. These standard measures of merit, and we have all kinds of evidence for this, do almost nothing to predict someone's abilities or potential to become a leader in their community or a really solid contributor to larger society. Okay. So part of what I want to suggest is we at least start rethinking how we make sense of, of that. And I think Joseph's comments really help us begin to see that 
retrospectively after having been at, at this institution for a number of years to say, I knew I was going to be successful because people believed in me. I knew I was going to be successful because there were people counting on me that I'm responsible to. So what is this thing called, called nation building? <clears throat> And without, I'm at the risk of totally uh, overexposing myself on on this. We had a book come out in 2012 that um, focuses on nation building and higher education. And part of what we argue in this book is is that um, for indigenous students, at least in the U.S., this is true. And there seems to be some evidence that is true in in Canada and in um, New Zealand and, and Australia as well. Those students who tend to do really well in institutions of higher education, almost all of them say, I've come to these institutions of higher education to serve a community and serve someone beyond myself. So here's what this is. Nation building is a political, legal, spiritual, educational, and economic process through which indigenous peoples engage in order to build local capacity to address their educational, health, legal, economic, nutritional, relational, and spatial needs. Okay. This is an all-encompassing, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary way of nations, tribal nations in particular, thinking about how is it that we can begin to determine what's best for us in the future, build on what we already know, and move forward in the process of building our nation. Okay? I, and I, I should say here, I, I, I don't particularly love this definition anymore because it's not about just building local capacity, it's about building and strengthening local capacity. If we don't talk about the strengthening part of it, we sometimes miss the fact that communities already have that. There's already capacity in place, and so what we're doing in this work, what I want to argue institutions of higher education might do in this work, is to open up and draw out those capacities to build in some places where that's true by building programs, but to also strengthen the capacity that already exists. Under this sense of nation building, particularly tribal nation building, the primary motivation is to serve others. Okay? Again, it doesn't mean that the individual disappears. She or he most certainly does not. But the motivation, what wakes people up in the morning, is about how can I serve someone else. It isn't about what can I do for myself, it's about what can I do for others. Those of you all who know Ty Alfred's work and Jeff Corntassel's work over at UVic will know that this idea of nation building can certainly be fraught, particularly if we think about this from a dominant, dominant notions of the nation state. And so I'm always a little bit hesitant to talk about this without at least some disclaimer that this isn't really about sort of building and creating some sort of and, and strengthening and reinscribing some sort of imperialist agenda around the state controlling all things. This is specifically about tribal nations best determining for themselves what their needs are. And in order to do this, what it requires is for people to listen, listen with some sense of humility, and to be able and willing to engage and let someone else steer this. Think about what that means in institutions of higher education. Now, it may be different for you than it is in the U.S. UBC is a remarkable place. I keep finding out and people keep telling me how great it is, and I agree with that assessment. And so it may be that at UBC, people here aren't so wedded to their ideas that they're not willing to listen to what communities have to say and maybe let them steer. But in general, academics don't particularly like having other people say to them, here's what your research agenda might look like. Okay? because of this thing called academic freedom. And so part of this is I want to draw on some of Deloria's early work, which is to say, in this instance, academic freedom is not the same as academic license. Those are two fundamentally, fundamentally different things. And what I mean by that is, if we're going to work with and in and for tribal nations, academic freedom sometimes gets compressed with academic license. Okay? And so we as, an inst as institutions have to go into communities, listen with humility and respect, and begin to explore the questions that those tribal nations and communities outline for us rather than saying, I've got this really fancy degree from this really fancy institution and I'm going to tell you what's wrong with you. Okay? <laughs> I, I know that that wouldn't happen in, in your beautiful country. Um, it just happens in the U.S. <laughs> 
there's something important about tribal nation um, building with with this, and I, I think that um, Joseph's quote really helps us get at this. What these graduates would say to a person is, we want the same thing. We want our children to have teachers who can look into their hearts and know what they can be. We want teachers like us who understand what it means to grow up on the res so that we can help do the right thing. Tribal nation building is context specific. It's contextual. It's not a one size fits all. Tribal nations decide for themselves what makes sense for for them moving forward. It's about building and strengthening capacity, as I've said earlier, and it's multifaceted. Part of what's important about tribal nation building from my perspective is it doesn't separate out the education from the health, from the economic, from justice issues, and from from other issues. It starts mushing those things together. In the U.S., one of the challenges for us is that we have these databases all about education, but they're not connected to what's happening with health, both physical and mental. They're not connected with what's happening with economic issues. They're not connected to what's happening with our juvenile justice system. Okay? Our young native boys in the U.S. are five times more likely to be in special ed than to be in regular ed. We're, they are five times less likely to be um, above proficient in reading based on our standardized test than to be above proficient. And this may not surprise you, and I don't have a causal link for this. I'm hoping that someone who has a much better sense of numbers at some point will come along and think about how to do this. Our tribal boys are five times more likely to be in prison than they are to be in college. Okay. There's something profound about the fact that we're not connecting education and health and juvenile justice issues and economic issues across the board that we continue to live in these siloized ways of thinking about this work and to somehow suggest well it's just we're just teachers we can't do anything more than that tribal nation building essentially says demands in fact that we think about these things as a larger as a larger whole <laughs> these ties to democratic merit and nation building are profound because it's really about what's the capacity of individuals to serve larger nations and what's the capacity of nations to begin to outline for themselves really important ideas um, in terms of thinking about how to move forward. Now, you can imagine that this is disruptive in some ways because, um, again, it's not, I'm sure it's not true in Canada, but in the U.S., the government wants its native peoples to behave in certain ways, that is, to continue to be dependent on, on the federal government, right? to not do well in education, to not take control of their futures. And so this really is transformational as well. Transformative, it's also disruptive in particular ways. And so when we talk about this, when we talk about what's it mean to change the ways in which we admit young people to educational institutions, they'll say, well, we can't do that. We've never done that. Okay. You start digging into things, and again, I'm sure that this is just a U.S. problem, and if you look at, at individuals who have donors with deep pockets, their children who may not meet, the, meet those, those minimum requirements or may have a lower predictive index of how they're going to get in, always seem to get in. They always seem to do well. Okay. So some of what we're asking for is to think about what we're doing, how we do it, and to look for examples where this might, in fact, work. Okay, so here are some things that we did with this program that I think are important for our students as they came in. One is the fact that we started talking to our students about how to talk in the we rather than the I. It was about our program. It was about our agenda. It was about our move. It was about our connections to our nations and to one another. And this showed up in really interesting ways so that our students would often say we and the instructors in their class would say, don't you mean I? What do you mean we? Are you working on this paper with someone else? It's supposed to be your work and your paper. No, I just mean the collective we. There's a fundamental disconnect here in terms of the I and the we. But we're really thinking about these programs. It's just bigger than one person. Certainly individuals did great. They're doing great work. But for Joseph, who opens this statement, if, you, if we go back to it, you'll see that he talks a lot in the we. Okay? So this is fundamentally reorienting, reorienting what the process of higher education can and should be. Individuals are about what they contribute to the collective, and that's part of our agenda was to say, this isn't really about you. 
This is about the work that you're going to do in your nation and for your children. It's part of why I started with my own children. One of the, one of the hard lessons we learned is, is that as project directors in all of this, we had to be really intimately involved in our students' lives, in some ways disrupting sort of a professional distance. Right, in terms of what was there, but also I spent a lot of time behind closed doors with my colleagues saying, can we think about what you're asking someone to do? Joseph says there are still some sounds that my tongue can't make. We had a class with a special educator who's a dear friend of mine, continues to be a dear friend of mine, and she would say, if you can't make these 26 sounds, you won't pass my class. Okay. And you can't teach anyone how to read if you can't make these 26 sounds. Well, for someone who speaks Arapaho, there are some sounds that he can't make, still can't make them. So I had to sit down with her and say, let's think about this. Okay? He's obviously doing a fine job reading. His son is doing a fine job reading, and his other four children are doing fine jobs Reading, so help me understand this. And she would say, "This test has been normed. This has been normed on populations of five million people. We know it's true." And I said, "What's well, not true in this case?" And let's just try it out. But he's doing really well on every other component of this, except for this sound test. Okay? And to her credit, she moved on it. And as someone that they, she, she and Joseph still correspond. He still. Um, ask her for references. There was a move there, but that was the kind of work that part of what we had to do with the institution with our colleagues is to say, let's figure out how we're going to listen and let's figure out how we're going to advocate on this. And for me, there's a larger piece of this and moving from the I to the we. It's about this concept that my colleague Angelina Castaño and I have raised, which is programs like this, programs like your NITEP, original peoples who engage in the process of self-determining what's best for their tribal nations by educating their own children, our own children, as it were. In some ways, part of what we've found is that we really worked hard at trying to change the way the institution functions, but also how our programs function. I don't want to be misunderstood in terms of saying we had this all figured out and we got it right. We didn't. I, I've clearly had more failures than I've had successes in, in all of this. And where students have succeeded, it wasn't because of us. Okay. We provided a framework, we provided support, but ultimately they did their work. Okay. But there are some lessons that, that we thought about. And what we realized is, in the process of engaging in the idea of nation building with their tribal nations, Something interesting happened, and I, I, I'm a little embarrassed to admit this publicly, particularly when it's being, being recorded, because you all will say, how could he not know that? Is that we started to change the way the institution functions. The presence of these students in class, together, as a cohort, asking questions and saying, well, isn't there another way to do it? started to fundamentally change the way the institution thought about education and teacher preparation in this case. Now, in retrospect, it's like, well, duh. Okay? But I don't think we, I don't think I know. When we wrote this grant, we didn't go into it with any sense that we would change the way the institution functions. And part of it is really saying, look, this is a larger project. One of the ways we got our colleagues to move is to say, you're part of a larger movement. Let's, let's, let's do this work together. And for the institution is to say, look at the work we can do together working with these tribal nations. Okay. It is fundamental when we do this is to recruit and invest in individuals okay. with potential. And in order to know that, we spend a lot of time in communities with leaders, both urban reservation reserve communities and in urban ones. Okay. And saying, what is it that you need? What are your needs? What are your desires? Who is it among you that, think you, that you think might be a good teacher? Who can help do this work? And they started saying to us, yeah, we need teachers, but we also need business people. We need engineers. We need doctors and nurses. And so we said, okay, we'll help you with that. So we started connecting to people on campus and building those programs together, and then those students started talking with it. We had to provide financial support, obviously, and what we had to do is really focus on both our work with 
tribal nations, who, by the way, don't particularly, at least in, in the um, three states where we've done this, Utah, Arizona, and Alaska, tribal nations, surprisingly, don't care all that much for the educational institutions in them. Okay? Because what they'll do is they'll say they come and they take from us, but they haven't given back. So what we had to do is reframe this to say there's value added. Yes, it's great to have these students on your campus. It's also great for these tribal nations to be able to draw on resources that the institution has and to build and work on this project together. And then a focus on what's possible is huge for us. It's one of the most important lessons that we've learned from this work and one of the most important parts of this notion of democratic merit and nation building that I think is important. It moves away from saying we can't do this to saying we absolutely can and here's how. And we have the capacities already in place to do it. We need to work with, with educational institutions to begin thinking about doing it. And one of the ways that we did this was starting to say let's look in the heart of these applicants. Those are Joseph's words. Those aren't our words. But the idea of thinking about potential and capacity and possibilities is about looking in the hearts of individuals. Okay. There's probably not my first typo, but a typo nonetheless. I apologize. Okay. I don't know enough about psychology to know about whether or not putting id there says something about me. <laughs> I'll let, I'll let someone else determine whether or not it's some deep-seated issue that I have. Um, and there are a lot of them, so it won't be hard to find them. I just don't know if this, is, if, this is, if this is adding to it or it exposes one that already exists. Look, this is hard work. Okay? And we get it wrong all the time. All the time we get it wrong. But we keep going back, and to their, their credit, the tribal nations have, have allowed us to keep coming back. But if there isn't a collaboration, if there isn't a two-way street going back and forth, it's not going to work. Our educational leaders at our institutions have to be in communities to recognize what's there, to understand what it means to be welcomed on those lands, and have to welcome tribal leaders onto our own campus. And we have to think about what are the long-term sustainable outcomes. This tribal nation stuff is a long-term agenda. This is not something we do in a year or five years or in a decade. And quite frankly, it's not something that we'll, I, I think we'll ever be done with. Okay, so we're starting to see some of the fruits of our labor, but at some point it comes a time to pass it off to someone else and let them move forward. In the same ways that tribal nations are passing them off for their leaders, their leaders change to be able to say, we're going in a new direction. Okay. We have to listen with some sense of humility in terms of what there, what's there. And again, I know this isn't an issue here at UBC, but in lots of other places, academics, humility is not at the top of our list of what's required to be able to do our work. In fact, we're supposed to be right. We're supposed to be sure. Okay? Confidence is super important. And it's different than not having humility. Okay? This is about saying we've got something to learn. Let's work together. I want to engage and play with you, and I understand that this is serious business. The final piece of this is really thinking about how do we intersect the economic, the political, and educational goals. And I should really add health there in terms of this. If we're going to think about nation building and think about this work, this is really crucial for us to be able to do this, but higher institutions of higher education have to be included in this. Tribal nations across the board in general agree about this. Okay. They don't agree that it's, tri that it's institutions of higher education that should be steering the ship, however. Okay. They're somewhere in the middle on the front, rowing, paddling as hard as they can, but it's someone from the tribal nation in the back who's steering. Okay. And we need to build spaces where students can, even on campus, and you were really fortunate to have this beautiful space right down the hill in the First, uh, First Nations Learn Learning House. Um, did I get that right? House of Learning. House of Learning. My apologies. Okay. Those spaces are really important. One of the things we've recently learned is... Um, in this that has really fundamentally changed the way 
we work at Arizona State University. We've got this Pueblo doctoral cohort with these 19 tribal nations, uh, um, 19 Pueblos in, in New Mexico. They already have leaders who are there. They don't want to have their leaders leave the community, but they want some of the skills and credentials and bodies of expertise that institutions of higher education can provide them. And so they came to us and they said, bring ASU to us. Our communities can't afford to lose these leaders. How are you going to do this? So every week I get on an airplane and I fly east about an hour and 10 minutes and then I rent a car and I drive north about an hour and 20 minutes and I teach class. And our other faculty do the same thing. Okay. Now, I know you all are thinking, it's Arizona, but don't they have internet? Um, and we do, and sometimes we'll utilize that, but for the most part, there's something important about the face-to-face -face connections between instructors and its students, okay? and their students, and the institution's students. It also forces faculty to have to be in community, and to have to engage in feasts, and to interact with tribal peoples. And it has been, we're not surprised at this, transformational for the faculty. They are, our colleagues are clamoring to be part of this. Okay? Because what their colleagues are saying is, this is the best experience I've ever had. Okay? There's something about saying, yes, this is a great space. It's a beautiful campus. I don't know that I've seen one more beautiful, to be perfectly honest with you. There's something beautiful that can happen in communities, and when we force students to come here, in some ways we're asking them to have to change and alter the way they think, the way that they're positioned by people outside of them, the way they have to position themselves. And sometimes it's important for us as faculty me members and leaders to have to do the same. So this is not a how-to talk. This isn't how do you do nation building. It's really about these guiding principles. Okay, Listen. Listen with humility. Allow tribal nations to drive the agenda in terms of what's there. No, an institution should know its strengths. It should have leaders who can guide. But it shouldn't be, these programs can't be based on a cult of personality. That is, one of the lessons we've, we've learned and we've observed is sometimes programs are a product of who leads them. There's a dynamic personality who can fill a room. And when they leave, there's no structure in place for someone else to come along in. So they've got to be structured. And this is true on the tribal nations side as well, so that there is constant communication that goes back and forth. Yeah. There's something important about sustainability, and part of what uh, um, I'm starting to come and think about is the fact that it's not about just sustainability in terms of leaving things the way they are, but moving towards an indigenous notion of stewardship. And stewardship in this case is really about leaving things better than you found them. Okay. So it's not about just leave it the way it, the way it is. That's not what nation building is about. It's about changing it. It's about transforming it. It's about disrupting it. It's about creating something new and better. And so this is about a model of stewardship in that regard and not one of sustainability. Unless your definition of sustainability is to make things better. In which case, we're all good. And it's about providing a space for students to be able to do their work without losing some sense of who they are. So let me end with where I started. These are more recent pictures. This spring, my father with our, our two boys over um, in the south, a good glass of Kool-Aid makes everything better. Um, do you all have Kool-Aid? Are you going to tell me that Kool-Aid's a Canadian thing? <laughs> <laughs> I keep finding out all the things I think are great are Canadian. Um, a cool glass of Kool-Aid, and then this picture was just taken on, on Saturday at uh, Granville Island. Um, democratic merit suggests that we think seriously about potential and capacity of individuals to make meaningful contributions to society. Okay. I have seen my father both graduate from high school and get married. He spent a long time in the armed forces doing his work. 
He had some behavioral issues his last year of high school, which meant he didn't graduate from high school in the college where he ended up going to several years later. Never looked at his transcripts to see that he hadn't completed. And so as a 10-year-old, I watched my father graduate from, graduate from, from high school. At 65, he went back to the same elementary school that he started at as a student to go back as a guidance counselor. And he spent 10 years working there as a guidance counselor. His teacher, his principal, it was a, a woman about 20 years younger than he was who also went to this school. And the vast majority of the teachers at this school had all been students there. And to watch my father go to work and to watch kids that look like this climb up his legs and pull on his glasses and ask him what he was up to and have him talk back to them is in part what this sense of nation building starts to look like in this small school called Pembroke Elementary School. Okay. It's about being able to go to a school, have people come back there who have gone there to begin to serve it in a particular kinds of capacity. And it's about making sure that these boys have a better experience than both he and I did. It's fascinating to me because people, when I show pictures like this, will say, but you're not in it. How can I not be in a picture? Look at those smiles. <laughs> I connect those two kids with that man. And I connect these kids to their future. And so when I think about this as something that has to be done with humility and with seriousness, I say that because it's not about me. It's about them. And if they decide to have children, their children, and children that look like them. So this, we're, we're thinking about possibilities and capabilities forces us to think well beyond ourselves. And that's the project I want to suggest that at least we consider taking up in institutions of higher education. So thank you very much.